Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, been thinking about growth uh, this morning from tiny roots, and we've been thinking about trusting in God, being still, and know that I'm God, and the two are linked together in this word I'm going to bring. We're going to start off. If you've got your Bible with you, in Isaiah, a prophecy that uh, uh, he prophesied 700 years or so before the coming of Jesus. And uh, is it Isaiah's voice we hear as we read these words, or is it the God, the voice of God, or is it somehow in, in the Trinity we can hear the, the voice of Jesus speaking about God? Um, Isaiah chapter 5. All about God's love for his people. And if he loves them, he wants to see growth and fruit. I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard that I've done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad. Now I'll tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I'll take away its hedge and it will be destroyed. I'll break down its wall and it will be trampled. I'll make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. I'll command the clouds not to rain on it. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel and the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. And he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed. For righteousness, but heard cries of distress. You feel this love that God has for his vineyard? He's looking for, for grapes, he's already built the wine press. And he sees no fruit at all. 700 years before the birth of Jesus, uh, his beautiful vineyard of his people ignoring him, going against him. And history shows that uh, 150 or so years after um, Isaiah, Nebuchadnezzar came and finally took them into exile because they continued to, to fail God. There was continuous injustice in the land. And uh, eventually, of course, they came back from Israel, but for 400 years between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament, there was um, various armies and came uh, against his people, and eventually, of course, the Romans came. And eventually, in the darkness, Jesus was born. And uh, from the age of about 30 to 33, he went around healing sick, raising the dead, giving sight to the blind, and uh, in those last hours before he was arrested, he uh, went into that room for the Passover. There he knelt down at the feet of his disciples and washed their feet. And then he took bread and he, he, he broke it and said, it's my body given for you. Took the cup and said, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, given for you for the remission of sins. And you can sense the love in that upper room as he knew what was about to happen in these last few hours um, before he would be arrested and crucified. And at the end of John chapter 14, he says, Come now, let us leave. And Jesus walked out of the upper room on his way to the Gethsemane and I suspect as he was walking along between the upper room and Gethsemane he probably walked through a vineyard and John 15 
starts with this, where Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, so it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you'll remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friend. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I've made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last. So that whatever you ask in my name, the father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. And so, from those verses in Isaiah, where the Father is saying, look, I've done all this for you, and now I'm just going to let you die and be withered um, because you haven't produced fruit. Now Jesus has come, uh, and he's brought, come, and he says, I am the vine. My father's the gardener. And the father is asking the question, he's asking the question of us this morning as well, and the question is this, where is the fruit? And perhaps we should ask the question, how do you produce fruit? Well, perhaps you should have a good action plan to produce fruit. And churches need an action plan as to the way forward and perhaps we should have a good action plan to step forward in faith. And that would be a good thing to do. But first of all, before we start on our action plan and even before we start forming our action plan, we need to look at this. What is our relationship with Jesus? Are we abiding in him? Are we close to him are we wanting to do it our own way with our own bright ideas or are we going to be grafted into him that he will be the source of the life and the fruit that we will bear we need to respond to the gardener's hands and you can sense the way the gardener loves this vine this, these people and how he painstakingly brings out the, the pruning shears to cut off the bits that aren't producing the fruit so that he'll have a, a good stock there that will produce the fruit that he wants. The love that he has as he cares for this and as he prunes and as he fertilises. And then the key to this growth we find in verse 4 where Jesus said, remain in me. Like when Jesus, uh, Linda brought those words, be still and know that I'm God. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can get, bear fruit 
by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. It's so easy to be independent, to think we can do it ourselves, to think we have sufficient uh, knowledge and strength and bright ideas to go forward and fail to remain in me. In verse 5, Jesus says, I am the vine. So all that time since um, Isaiah spoke about the people of God uh, being the, the vine, Jesus said, it's me. I'm the answer to this. I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I'm in and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So there's a word here, several words here for us that can't end. Jesus says, you will bear much fruit. But that's only in the middle of the sentence. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. And then Jesus says these vitally important words to us as we think, we still know that I'm God, apart from me, you can do nothing. So we need to look again at our relationship with Jesus as we seek an action plan for the way forward. Are we abiding in him? Are we trusting in him by his Holy Spirit to <coughs> provide us with that life-giving uh, sack to go through us uh, from the, the main branches uh, of the vine to us, uh, the, the, the branches that will bear the fruit. You will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And look at uh, God's love. You can sense, as they were in that upper room, that sense of Jesus loving his disciples, knowing the sacrifice he was about to make for him and for all believers that will follow. Uh, the sense of those three years of working together has come to this vital uh, stage now. And in verse 9, as perhaps they're walking through this vineyard on the way to Gethsemane, as the Father has loved me, so as I love you. This declaration of love from the Lord of glory. Look, the Father loves me, I love the Father, and I love you just the same. He says, now remain in my love. It's so easy to wander off. It's so easy to have a cold heart towards the Lord Jesus. You know, we can be actively involved in religious work, or working for the church or whatever, and still have that cold heart towards Jesus and not being listening to him and relying on him. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I've kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. Down in verse 12 it says, my command is this, all right? This is a relationship of love, but it's a relationship with a command. You know, I, I love my wife dearly. I, I very rarely actually command her to do anything. I find it doesn't work too well. <laughs> <laughs> There's no option here. He's got this great love for us and all the authority to command us with something. And this is a command for God in Baptist Church. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. It's very easy in a group of people to get a few niggles between one another and decide you, you know, you're not too keen on somebody or other. Or it's easy to upset one another. And we've got to be very careful about that. Because if we've got a gospel of love for people, we've got to pe be a people who love one another. If we've got a gospel of reconciliation, we have to be a people who can be reconciled with one another. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's own life for one friend. We have to lay down our life, lay down our agenda sometimes because of love. 
And uh, the whole reason that he's called us and loved us is down in verse 16. You didn't choose me, but I chose you. It'd be good. That God saw each one of us out and chosen us and called us. I've chosen you and appointed you. We've got an appointment or an anointment, if you like. Appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last. Eternal fruit. Of course, in Galatians, we have the fruit of the Spirit, the love and the joy and the peace and the long suffering and so on that the fruit has got to, to bear. And all of that fruit, as our characters change and become more and more like Jesus, comes from this, remaining in Him. My prayer for myself and for yourselves is that we will remain close to the Lord Jesus, trusting in His strength and His wisdom, looking for His character to change our character, looking for His spirit to overflow the, <coughs> the Father loves the vine, vineyard and the vine is looking for good fruit. He's called us to bear that fruit and he calls us to change and to be filled with him to bear fruit, fruit that will last for eternity. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that in various ways this morning you've been speaking to us about growth and about being still and knowing you in our lives. Forgive us, Father, that so often we've almost cut ourselves off from you, been remote from you, been cold to you, towards you, and haven't loved you as you have loved us. Change our hearts. Give us hearts of flesh instead of hearts of stone. May you be the centre of all that we do in all of our lives. May you be the centre of our action plans for our church. Let us tune in to you and listen to your voice. And out of love for you, love for one another, love for the lost, may we see that growth. Promises. We pray in Jesus' name.